RH, quer saber como voar no trabalho? É só usar a Flash. Com a Flash, você concentra toda a gestão de pessoas em um único lugar. Faça a admissão dos colaboradores e solicite mais de oito categorias de benefícios. Ah, e você ainda pode fazer todo o controle de ponto. Conheça o novo onboarding integrado da Flash em flashapp.com.br. Antes de ser Optimus Prime, ele era Orion Pax. Antes de ser Megatron, ele era D-16. Antes deles serem rivais, eles eram amigos. Todos os Transformers têm uma origem. Você está pronto para descobrir? Vem aí, o filme de origem mais aguardado da história. Transformers, o início. Dia 26 de setembro, somente nos cinemas. Subscribe on iTunes at Toddcast Podcast. Love it. Todd, hey, Todd. Oh, I love it, buddy. Thank you for posting that video. That made me feel so that, good. <laughs> that's so crazy, right? Like, I, I'm, I, I've done it before with those guys, but I'm fully not expecting him to say, hey, come on up and, you know, blast this song out with us again, man. That was a fucking crazy night, as the Roxy always gets, right? Dude, it yeah. is so perfect. Okay, one. Two, the fact that you didn't drop your drink <laughs> like Julian on the trailer park, boys. I know, like, right? No spillage. You're sitting there. Drink is totally still. Like, yeah. you got this. <laughs> and you're just cranking it out in the mic. Perfect. What's just stopping, it. you know? Yeah, it's just <laughs> such a fun night. Antonio, man, so, so good to see you. Oh, dear, good to see you too, man. Thank How's you. everything going? You know, as good as can be, I guess, like all things considered, we're, I think we're out of it. So, yeah, it's, it's going great, man. Yeah. I mean, look, that's, you know, it's not even a blip in the road, really. You know what I mean? It's like you just got to push past it. We're not going to remember it in 10 years. Uh, I got a little uh, rude awakening this morning when I walked into um, the production office that I'm doing, that I'm working with next, and everyone was wearing a mask. And I'm like, what's going on? Are we masking up or is this what we're doing? And it's like, yeah, that's what we're doing. Okay. So, you know, it's still out there, but, you know. Well, just... sure. Like, I went to the dentist the other day, and they're like, where's your mask? I'm like, what do you mean, where's my mask? Yeah. As far as I knew, there wasn't a mask mandate anymore. They're like, no, you need a mask. I'm like, well, I didn't bring one. They're like, here you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Luckily, right. they have them. They used to charge at some places, like two bucks. I know, right? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> the physiotherapist, they'd charge for like a five-cent mask, like two dollars. I'm like, you guys. I got kill me. Totally. So, Bro, I'm, uh, I'm you remember... Back. On a side note, do you remember the last time we we sat at that place downtown? You were just starting your podcast. Oh, okay. Well, we were eight, sitting in a, that's eight years ago then. Eight years ago, we were sitting in a place on ground. I remember you just starting, and I was thinking to myself, what is this like podcast? Like, what is it even? What what's it about? You know what I mean? Like, what is what is what is the the deal with podcasting? And you were like one of the early adopters of this thing. Oh, for sure. And, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just had so many people there. Like when I got let go from CFOX, so many of my friends were like, dude, you know podcasts, right? I'm like, no, I don't. I know radio. Yeah. They're like, well, start a podcast. Get like, how many people do you know that like run a business that are GMs of places you've hosted events for? Like talk to those people and say like, hey, man, give me 300, 500,000 bucks a month. Like they'll do it to help you out. And it's a tax write off anyway, right? Yeah. Like it's not a, if you're going to put out something that's really good, a good product, they'll fucking sponsor you, dude. Yeah. And you do, you know, you do when you were at C Fox, you know, that, that was the, you know, you had the, the gift of the gap I mean, you, you were great, you know, on the radio. So you should be. And, and you just like, it was like a, such a smooth transition. I feel like people have to like, oftentimes they like think about things for way too long and they miss opportunities. Whereas like yours was just like, you left and you just started something new. I literally waited for my severance to run out like nine months because they're, I was trying to get them to pay me out so I could start the podcast sooner. Right. Oh, right. And they're like, yeah, we can do like 70%. And I'm like, no, like I got let go for no good reason. So you guys are paying me every single cent you owe me. Right. Yeah, of course. So once, once, it, once my severance ran out, man, yeah, I just, uh, yeah, it's, it's funny. Like it looking back, of course, it's easy to be like, oh yeah, it's fucking super successful. Tons of, you know, great guests and lots of great yeah. sponsors and made a lot of money and all that. But yeah. like living through it, man, was like, whoo, whoo, some lean, lean times in those first couple of years, man. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I, I hear that. I hear that it takes a couple hard years of 
and that's probably not a hard and fast rule. I'm sure people, you know, either either fail or succeed at different times. But you know, collecting your um, your material and learning how to do uh, all the various technical aspects of of what you're doing, yeah. etc. Yeah. It's just like it's just so mind blowing what it became. You know, like the whole kind of you know podcast Rogan kind of era where it's just like everything shot up, and now everyone's got one. I know it's crazy. And, Every you know, looking, yeah. But, but everybody could though, right? Cause everybody like, dude, you could start up one tomorrow and make good money doing it. it I can it's just, a, it's a matter of time. That's I can all it is. It, like, I consider and I still do, but you know, I have this thing where it's just like, who gives up about my opinion? You know what I mean? Like really could it I be? Yes, but me? you could do this though with all like your buddies, like in, in the rock world, in the acting yeah. world, like just people that you find like inspiring and shit. Like it doesn't yeah. need to be necessarily like, I, I don't give my opinions unless it comes up in conversation with like in these interviews. It's not like I, it's not like I jump on and go like, man, I'm specifically going to talk about the trans world today, or I'm specifically right, yeah, yeah. talking about the way that tattoos are still, you know, vilified in, in, in public or yeah, I, I don't, I don't attack it like that. I'm more just like, I kind of want to just get, you know, stories from people. Yeah. And if my opinion comes out, it comes out. Right. It's not, I'm yeah. specifically, you know, attacking uh, uh, things with opinions, but yeah, yeah. I, I like, that's the thing. Like anybody that has a following is 50 people. You, you could get, you could get money out of that. Like if that's your drive. Right. I yeah. mean, uh, for me, you know, unfortunately that was the, the purpose, I guess the nucleus of starting this, it was either that or like get back into radio. Yeah but I had all this time off and like, yeah, like, you know, I had enough people say like, dude, just start a podcast. You don't have to go back to radio. Yeah. Fair enough. Good for you. Just take but, control of your destiny, man. Oh, hundred percent. Like, and then I get, you know, I'm like three years into doing this podcast and then BCIT reaches out to me. They're like, Hey, obviously yeah. we know who you are from, from 20 years in radio, but like, yeah. we're really stoked about your podcast and like, marketing it and like all the shows that you're doing and everything else do you want to come work with us yeah, so it yeah. went from like you know podcasting to now i'm like one of the instructors for like probably the biggest radio course and meet like media course in canada wow bro it's nuts man that's cool hey, man, very cool you know you, you know where you start but you never know where you end up exactly yeah. which which kind of let me spin it with the way that i know you of course i don't know you through the acting world that everybody now knows you obviously because mm -hmm. of right like we go back like i'm thinking and i'm talking to jess i'm like do you remember antonio cupo from uh from hybrid cartel and she's like ring it rings a bell and i'm like yeah good looking dude funny guy fucking killer front man and she's like i think so like we go back it's got to be close to 20 years hey yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's really wild. Actually, I was thinking about that the other day because um, uh, someone had mentioned something about, about singing and they were just like, it's like, what? Like you? And, and they were like, yeah, Cooper used to play in a band. And they were like, what? And cause suddenly, you know, people see you as something because that's what you're doing. It's like, right. if, you're, if you're doing construction, they see you as a construction worker. It's like, well, he plays piano. It's like, oh, really? Sure. Like, I didn't know he works that. at Pizza Hut. He's a pizza guy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, there's, there's, and you know, you could be so many things in life and you could, um, you know, that, I, I guess it represents a kind of a period in my life because I did in a way, um, you know, turn my back, so to speak on it and, and just kind of move in another direction. I, I was always at the same time I was playing music and music, I was kind of always acting. And what had happened was I was taking all of my acting money and spending it on music. And I had this sort of light bulb go off in my head because, you know, music is like, but when you're, when you're like, you're buying guitars, you're buying amps, you're buying studio time, you're, you're buying everything, right. you know, it's like, and, and for what, you know, like, yeah, you get, you get a few spins on the radio here and there, but that's not going to pay your bills. So it's really a labor of love. And when you, when you approach it like that and you understand it as, as that, I think you can start enjoying it in a different way. But yeah. if you're trying to make money from it because that's all you want to do, you want to play rock and roll, um, you know, that's, that's kind of like, a, and maybe it sounds a little bit like a kind of romanticized notion of wanting to play rock and roll and, and being very poor is, is actually the real case uh, because that's, that's usually how it plays out. Right. 
it's, it's a grind the whole time. Like it never, the grind never stops if you're in a band like that, right? It never stops. Never. It never stops. And I remember we were like, even before Hybrid Cartel, you know, we were like making, um, making uh, mixtapes, like the, our songs, like putting it together on cassette tapes uh, <laughs> with a band called Starfly. Um, and we would, we would go in, in, yeah, in the lineups, we would, we would go in the lineups of like the Roxy or whatever, when bands are playing, we just like hand out tapes. Yeah. 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 And people would take these tapes and put them in their cars. And three years later, be like, Oh my God, I still love that. You know, that, that mix, that tape that you guys made, I have it in my Chevette. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just like, everyone had a Chevette back then. Right. It's just like yeah. or a Cavalier with like a cassette player. Yeah. Um, and it was and so like, let, me, let me toot your horn for you because, you know, being, you know, in that part of your, the circle, the, the radio part of that, that side, you know, you guys were poised to really break out in Canada. There were a lot of radio stations that were like looking at Fox, going like hybrid cartels being played on the Indie Night in Canada show. They're, they're into the seeds contest. There were like the Bear and and CJ and in Calgary and and Power ninety seven in Winnipeg and like there were uh-huh. radio stations looking at your band. Did it feel that that you were close to to making it? I mean, you know, I think with with Seeds, it definitely it felt like we were getting closer for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, C Fox was one of those was one of the stations that took a chance, you know, and and risked it. I don't know if we were. We had went and played a uh, bunch of shows because of seeds across Canada, and we did, and we, and I felt like we were on to something good. Um, but you know, the it just it's one of those things, right? That's like it, it was kind of like, do is this your is this your is this your road? Like, is this is this your path? I love music, you know, and I felt like. I felt like management was not my strong suit. In fact, I, I do a lot of managing now, um, like I'm, of my of my crews and producing movies, et cetera. But managing certainly was not my strong suit. And when you're managing a band, you know, on a basal level, you're like, you are in fact, yeah, like we were writing the songs, you're booking the gigs, you're doing it all. You kind of have to have this sort of a meter within yourself to say, how good are we? Like, are we are we Canada good? Are we stadium good? Are we globally good? You know? And I felt like we were at the point where everyone had their own sort of little careers and that they were kind of doing little things here and there. And certainly mine was moving in a positive direction in film. And I had to make a decision. Am I going to continue to take film money on music or am I going to cut my losses and focus on an art that I am solely responsible for. So I'm not towing any weight. It's only me. If I choose to get up in the morning, if I don't choose to get up in the morning, I will be the benefactor of those successes, so to speak. And also, and also the person who will be the only person responsible for my failures. And it was kind of a light bulb. I was just like, what am I doing? And I just started acting more and I kind of, uh, I kind of switched gears on the band scenario, and I, I started writing. But also because I started traveling a lot, and I went to Italy, and I worked in film over there for several, several months, and it ended up being an eight-year stint. So it was like, I just, I came back to a radio scene that was completely different. Right. I mean, the music was different, the people were different. The, you know, the all of my my band members were off doing other projects. I mean, it was just like. You know, when you leave a country for that amount of time, you come back, for you, it's like you just left. The, like the day before yesterday, you just left. You mm-hmm. think everything's going to be exactly the same. And then suddenly you have eight years. You know, when you left, you were like, let's say 25. Now you've got all of those 15-year-olds who never held a guitar playing at the Roxy. <laughs> you know what I mean? And all these other places in town. And the music is different. It's totally changed. Right. So now you need like to reset, you know, and, and, and I did, I, I went and made a record after I got back in like 2012, but I just put it out on Apple and, uh, and it's out there. It's called Antonio Cupo and the Violet Chronicles. Um, and, uh, and I did it with my, my brother-in-law, Dave Martone, um, who in fact is, you know, one of the, the best guitar players of all time. Virtuoso straight Virtuoso, up. Virtuoso. Yeah. It's just happened to marry my sister, but, yeah. um, 
but also he had this, he's got this amazing studio and I'm just like bro like I've got these songs that I've been playing over the last five years in my bedroom. Can we just like put these down? And he's like, yeah, sure. So we put them down. I was expecting him to like, you know, um, to, to, you know, uh, create amazing, you know, uh, you know, ripping solos throughout all the stuff. And in fact, it wasn't that at all. He encouraged me to play the guitars on it. And he was uh, here and there featured just minimally. But um, the experience was so great for me because I had never really recorded all of the guitars before on any of my tracks. It was always a band. So suddenly I had this real sort of self-indulgent kind of project where it was just me. I was lyrics. I was, I was um, you know, melody. I was, uh, I was guitars. Uh, I was basically everything. And then I got to produce uh, the music and we brought in a guitar, uh, sorry, a, a drummer and a, and a bass player. And I got to sort of, you know, produce them and conduct, you know, how I would want them, uh, yeah. how I want it to be, to sound. And yeah. it, like I said, it was really self-indulgent. It's kind of this wacky kind of project, um, you know, it's different styles all over the place. And that wasn't encouraged in the time of C Fox. If you had one song that was different than another, you weren't going to get a record deal. They wanted once one hit and then 10 other songs that sounded like that hit. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? If you tried to do like a Beatles project where every song was was so incredibly different one from the other, it was like you didn't have a focus. Right. Do you remember that? Am I just, well, for am sure. I just no, no, no. It's for sure. And it's still like that almost present day. It's so freaking sad because I remember sitting in rooms go with with writing partners going like, no, 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 this one sounds too different. It's like too poppy, or it's got, you know, the chorus is too. Uh, you know, too wild or outrageous or different. And some of the music that I like most today um, is, has got, you know, it's got like differing melodies and three melodies at once, you know, between the guitars and the vocals and the, you know, and the hook and whatever else. And like all of these things that are sort of coming in and you go, man, you know, maybe you should just not always listen to people. And just do whatever the hell you want. You know, ding, what I mean? ding, 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 ding. Like, 100%. Who says, who says that someone has to create your sound? Like, no one creates my acting style. That's me. I found my sound. Right. Right. So, guitar players find their sound, vocalists find their sound. Suddenly, yeah. you know, you look at everything in life and you go, hold on. No one has the answers here. The answers are within me. So it's kind of also a little bit of like, what were you being influenced by as a kid growing up? Like, what are you, what are your parents playing to get you to go down that path in the first place? Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, my parents really pay much. My parents are more just like, they were working like 90%. My dad still works like 18 hours a day. He's like, wow. he's one yeah. of those people that will never stop. will never stop, um, you know, working. Uh, I believe he said, when you stop, when you stop working, you start dying at one point. So it's like, <laughs> so you definitely do not want to stop where, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of true. Like people get, you know, you, 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 you just sort of stop working at like 65 and then you see him at 70 and you're like, Oh my God, you're like, you really let yourself go. Yeah. Whereas, whereas if you just never stop, you, you kind of just, your brain is just continually, you know, working. Yeah. So you, you know, you just, you're, you're in it. So we didn't do that. My dad listened to a lot of Italian music um, in his in his old, you know, Cordoba or whatever it was, you know, on an eight track, you know. And, and I, I still want to hear those songs. They they remind me of those days. My mom was a little bit more into music. She was into like Cream and uh, Elvis and you know those bands from like the sixties and seventies. A lot of folk, but also some uh, some rock and roll. Um, I was more influenced by by rock, uh, Led Zeppelin, and, you know, it's like, that's my, that's my, my jam. However, um, <clears throat> when I started to really become uh, more influenced was the early, uh, you know, the early alt rock scene that was, oh. you know, yeah, like the early nineties, that was, that was really my thing. And I just, it's kind of your jam too. I'm, I'm sure like that whole, um, you know, oh, Nirvana, sure. the Seattle scene, you know, and then, then later on Nickelback and that whole sort of, yeah. Uh, you know that whole era yeah 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 and interesting you're you're mentioning dave martone and you know mar married to uh, carmelita uh she was the one that kind of really got you into acting right 
Yeah, actually, that, that's that's true. It's, it's I feel like all of my successes in life, Carmelina was responsible for them. Like there's looking, she was looking for an agent and she's like, you should give me your headshot. And then, you know, I got an agent from that. Um, you know, she said, she was like, hey, you know, like they really need actors in the, you know, the school plays. And I was like, all right, you know, like, sure, I guess I'll come. She's like, you really should come. You know, I was playing sports and doing other things. And then suddenly I found this passion for, you know, for, for being on, on, you know, being in the spotlight in that way. Um, you know, I guess being in the spotlight is not the thing. It was more just acting and yeah. the spotlight came along with it. But, you know, all of my successes in life are, are, are due to my sister. She's been uh, an amazing influence uh, in my life. I think. Yeah, she's obviously super cool as well, right? Yeah, and she's still playing music like all the time. Oh, cool. Yeah. And, yeah. and what's like when you think back to like being a little, little kid? Yeah. What are your first memories of TV shows and, and movies and actors and all that? You know, it's wild. I work with a lot of these people now. Yeah. Yeah, dude. I mean, you've worked with you like, know, like and Kingsley um, and, and Dennis Hopper and like. I, I sent you a message. Not, yeah, but, Penelope Cruz, like, what in the, f what is going on here, man? Uh, did I ever tell you about the Penelope Cruz story? No. Oh my god! So we were like, we were on that set. Isabel Crichet is the director. And she's she's just phenomenal. Um, and and Penelope Cruz, and I show up. You know, uh, I get I get hired for this job, and I, I'm I'm playing her brother. I'm playing her brother in the movie. That, that's what I get hired for. And I was like, okay, cool. You know, play a brother in the, in the movie. And, and suddenly, you know, I, I get a call a few weeks later and it's like, Hey, um, uh, there's been a big change and, um, uh, you Penelope no longer wants you to play her brother. And I was like, Oh, and I remember I was in LA and my agent called me and I'm just like, Oh, that sucks. All right. Well, you know, it was kind of too good to be true anyways. And, you know, let's just move, move on. And she was like, no, uh, in fact, she wants you to play her lover. Wow. And I was like, what? She's like, yeah. Um, she saw the headshots on the wall and she was like, no, this guy can't be my brother. He's got to play my lover. And I'm going, uh, this is insane. And they said, oh, and by the way, for the change, they want to like increase your rate because they, you know, they feel bad that you, you know, lost this role for this other role uh, casting. So, and I'm just like, oh, okay, like literally I will do this for free. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> and, uh, oh, and uh, so then I finally, you know, and it's, and it's like a month and a half away or something. So it's, it's some time and I'm just working out like crazy. I'm like, I'm playing her lover. It's going to be this like grandiose sex scene. This is like my, you know, like my, uh, you know, is that, that they always say Brad Pitt was discovered for his, his part in Thelma and Louise where he's like, you know, plays like the guy with this Six pack yeah, in the hotel room so, area. I'm like working. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, yeah. So I'm working out every day, just killing myself in the gym. And I show up on set, and you know, Penelope's there, and we're like ready to start. And and the director's explaining the scene, and it's in the bathroom, right? It's just like this this sex scene in the bathroom. And I'm like, okay. So I said, she goes, yeah, throw her up on the counter, you know, and like, and then you have sex with her here on the counter. I was like, okay, but where do you want me to take off my shirt? And she's just like, what? I'm like, where do you? Like, I'm just going to like, I'll just take it off. Like before, like, she's like, no, no, you're not taking off your shirt. You're, you're having sex with someone. Have you never had sex with someone in the bathroom before? You don't, you don't take off your clothes. You just, you just have sex with them. And I'm like, oh, oh, and I just figured maybe like, cause I wanted to show off my body. I was like, yeah, this is going to be amazing. I've been working out for like, you know, a month and a half, killing myself in the gym. <laughs> I'm getting nice. like branching amino acids, protein powder, creatine, you know, like I'm going through the list. She's like, she's no, you like, keep your shirt on, bud. Yeah, she's like, no, keep your shirt on. And actually, <laughs> going like, oh my god, like, this that's great. Sucks. Like this is like it's got to be better than this, right? So anyway, so we start the scene, and she goes, um, she goes, and, and, and you know, we're I'm making out with with Penelope in the in the bathroom, and, and you know, I go, I sort of go sort of halfway with things, and not really too, you know, I'm just kind of feeling it out to, to see how it's going to go, and yeah. the director goes, cut, 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 cut. She goes, cut. Antonio, for us, the um, breasts are very important. And I'm like, well, for us, they're important too. You know, she's from Spain, right? She's like, yeah. for us, they're very important. Can you take the Penelope breast in your mouth? And I'm like, excuse me? I, I said, it's, it's, 
what? Is, is Penelope okay with that? I turned around and Penelope's like, Jace. And I'm like, <laughs> oh. I was like, okay. I mean, this is the, you know, the, I guess the, uh, this is the stuff they don't teach you in acting class. You know what I mean? Yeah. So anyway, wow. we go ahead and do the scene. Not to get too graphic. We get all the bits and pieces the director wants that don't end up in the movie. Um, uh, but it is an, it's an incredible, an incredible experience all the way around. And I got to meet Penelope, of course. And, um, you know, that was before. Yeah, sure, you sure did. <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. She was really embarrassed. It was funny because I'm like, this, she's a big star, right? And I'm just a guy from, from Vancouver. And I'm, I'm like, uh, she's like, I'm not used to doing these kind of scenes. And she goes, it's never uncomfortable for me. And I said, just don't worry. Just think about how, how lucky you are to be doing this scene with me. <laughs> and she started laughing. <laughs> That's great, man. That yeah, was the great. icebreaker. Yeah, yeah. Which of, your, which of the roles, because of course we've seen you in so many cool shows. Uh, Roland Goff, by the way, Peacemaker, fucking deadly, man. That yeah, series that's... is like tight. Thank you. But which of which of the roles that you've played like have been your favorite? And I know it's fucking hard to ask, and it's tough. It's like they're all your kids and everything. But like, is there yeah. one that stands out above the the rest? You know, I mean, Peacemaker was was pretty awesome. Yeah. I got to say that it was. It, 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 yeah, it's like, and and it was recent, so I remember that being. Um, being you know a really a really great experience and you know if anyone hasn't seen it they should definitely check it out um i think it's just it's one of those those shows that is uh it's kind of that tongue-in-cheek humor that makes makes for really good tv if you get it you yeah. know i've had people even just say look i don't get it and it's because oh, they yeah. don't guarantee there's people that don't get it yeah they're like they don't get that kind of humor where it's yeah. like it's meant to be a uh, like a farcical or play on itself or funny, you know? Right. And John Cena is funny and James Gunn is funny and they think that shit is funny. So they make it, you know? Right. Um, but I did, I did a project a while back that I really enjoyed too. You know, the Soska sisters. Oh yeah. Local. Yeah. Yeah. I had local, local directors. I did that movie American Mary with them. Okay. And, and I played the, I, I played like this, this like sleazy bar owner um i don't know what they saw in me for this role clearly was a stretch <laughs> you know a lot of sleazy bar oh no just kidding um so uh yeah so i i, I did this movie with with them and, and the difference was on a movie like that is it was a true labor of love so it's like it's the pet project where it's like you could i'm like i want to bring my own costumes for the movie They're like yeah sure i want to bring my own my own jewelry for the movie yeah sure and I got to go back into my wardrobe and pull out boxes from like, you know, years earlier of like, you know, this is a jacket I wore at, at a show at the, you know, at, at you know, at the, the Commodore. Or this was a, you know, this is a pair of jeans that I wore, you know, at a, at a show. And uh, I have this, this, this like collection of all my old rock stuff, you know, because right. there's rock here. You remember that? Of course. You know? Yeah, yeah. You the, the belt with the buckle and the boots and the and the jeans and you know it's like, I mean we had a whole we had a whole shtick you know, and uh, and it was great and uh, I got to I got to dress myself and and create a character that I I, I thought was kind of uh, something that I didn't you know I'm not normally able to do because so many people are pulling strings on film sets, mm -hmm. right? and this one I had power to do something different. Yeah, which is cool because, of course, you don't get that very often. I'm not sure. They're probably like, yeah, dude, just bring whatever you want for wardrobe. No. Like, no. No. And that's, that's kind of why I started even producing because, you know, like I had an opinion about stuff. But, you know, the, the scariest thing for a producer is an actor with an opinion. Like, you never want to be an actor with an opinion. You want to be an actor that knows his lines, that shows up on, on time and says, you know, says his lines on cue. But you don't want to have an opinion, if at all possible, because right. generally those opinions are not welcome. <laughs> right. Say your lines, bud. Say your lines. Yeah. yeah, say your lines, you know, stay away from crafty after you're wrapped and go home. <laughs> so awesome. anyway. Hey, what was the first movie you saw in a the theater? Do you remember? Yeah, I do. It was, it was Jaws. Oh, it was Jaws. You must have been young then, too. Yeah, it was like 83, I think. And I saw it at the Dolphin Theater on Hastings. Oh wow! 
What was yours? Mine was uh, the Star Wars uh, A New Hope. Oh, what year was that? Like 77, 78. So I was like four or five. Seeing that in the theater, right? Like, I don't know That's that crazy. I don't know that I would have let my kids at four or five see that in theater. Absolutely not. Times they have not changed big time. <laughs> like, <laughs> although I have let I've let my kids watch some pretty fucking like, eh, like yeah. all the Lord of the Rings. They're like 12 and nine now, but they've seen that like three, four years ago. Right, yeah, and yeah. like think of those f- epic fight scenes in Lord of the Rings, and like yeah. all of the uh, all of the Indiana Jones, of course, all Star Wars, yeah, Harry Potter, all yeah. That. Well, I'm going through that right now because my I'm like kids why not five, five and a half and three and a half? Okay, you know, and my kids want to watch. Like my son wants to watch. Um, what was the one? The ball that he's like he's like a little character that he turns into a ball and he rolls and he, oh, he so, uh, Sonic. Sonic, yeah. yeah. Sonic, and I just I was listening to Sonic, the new one on like Netflix or whatever. Just listen, overhearing because I'm uh, the, the, with uh, Jim Carrey, yeah. And it's like you know they're calling each other stupid. They're calling each other you know all kinds of names, and I'm going like, okay, I had it when I was a kid for yeah. sure, and we turned out all right, you know, well, a little cross-eyed, but you know, all right, right. Um, Got this tick, but yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, for the most part, yeah, exactly. But um, I don't want my kids, I don't, I don't want my kids watching it. And it's like, I don't want also want to turn into like a, you know, parent that's like a total stickler for that. But I try not to, I, ju- I just try to keep it like really sort of PC for them. And it's, it's hard to do because oh, it means for sure. you, you change your, your whole life as you know it for them. Right. Well, but, until you know, after eight o'clock at night, maybe then it starts to become what you want to watch. Yeah, and it's like daddy juice. Yeah, daddy juice and smoke. Daddy juice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> oh man, uh, there is a kind of a duality to our lives, isn't there? Like, oh, you know, what your, how your kids know you are, and then how you actually are are two different things. Hundred percent, man. I mean, I I smoke a lot of reefer. I yeah. don't think I don't think uh, I don't think they know that I do. You know. Yeah. But it, that's coming eventually. Of course, I'm going to let them know. And, you know, it's all moderation and everything else. But, yeah, man, two totally different lives for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like it's how you marry those that I think really makes a difference. I mean, you know, being European, of course, I, I've always offered my kids alcohol. Oh. Like from the time they were they could basically like eat solid foods. Yeah. I've always like dip my finger in like a little glass of wine and like touch a lip. But that's also kind of like I, I, when I went through school for BCIT and radio and stuff, I live with my aunt yeah. uh, who are, it's an Italian family, Minichello. And it's kind of the, that's, oh, yeah. isn't that sort of like the, the, the customs or the heritage of Italian families? Is it not? 100%. Yeah. There isn't a, a, a child in Italy that has not tried wine or beer i mean no one's feeding kids spirits they're feeding them wine and beer right you know and um they're not even feeding them but it's there my kid sees a cup of coffee or a glass of wine or a beer he doesn't want to touch it right he just like, that's beer i don't like the taste of it when they were kids they were kind of curious about it i remember once my son came down and there was a beer on the table and he walked up and i'm sitting on the phone right we're just talking talking and he walks up down the steps right up to the table grabs my beer takes a sip puts it down and walks back up the steps. <laughs> and I was just like, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> That's you know, so awesome. Literally the last time he ever tasted, he ever tasted beer. Yeah. He found out he didn't like it. There you go. You know, there's, probably, you know, there's, no, probably no, there's probably less drinking problems in that country than there are in this continent. In Italy, there is in, in Italy and Spain, in, you know, in Europe in general, but, there is yeah. nudity, there's nudity on TV, right? And every on the beaches, show, and yeah. Yeah, every show's got dancing girls. People are smoking everywhere. People yeah. are, are drinking, I mean, literally daily with every single meal. And none of those problems ex- exist. You know? Right. It's because it's, know, it's not normalized, but uh, again, it's part of the customs. It's like, you know that you shouldn't be abusing that stuff. And then you go to like some places in North America 
that are so repressed sexually, uh, you know, and, and, and in other ways, and they just, they, 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 they get all twisted up in their brain and then they go up, end up, you know, shooting somebody or raping somebody or doing some crazy stuff. Right. It's like all these people needed was just a little bit of like an open mentality, like, hey, stuff exists, enjoy yourself, don't screw up your life. You know what I mean? Right. It's, like, well, it's, it's, it's almost it's because it's vilified, right? It, it's almost at that point of like, oh, don't do this. You can't drink until you're 19. You can't do this until. And it's because of that. It's like, okay, uh, maybe now I will want to try it and then I'll do it too much. Dude, how many times were you sitting at the Roxy and there's like, you know, a busload of girls from, from you know, that are like just turned of age for Canada yep. and they are showing up just getting sloshed. Right. You know, guys and girls getting sloshed because it's, it's two years, you know, we have drinking age two years before America. So, you know, they're coming up here and they're getting hammered. Right. Is, well, is, is the drinking age still the same? 19, yeah. 19 here, right? Yep. Yeah. And it's 21 for America. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So they're coming up here getting wasted. Wasted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're going like, all they have to do is lower the drinking age and they can get wasted at least and go home and sleep and not, you know, find themselves in a, in a, in a difficult situation to be in. Right. Right. You know, compromising situation in another country. Yeah. Right. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Hey, uh, I want to wrap it up here real quick. Um, thank you again for doing this, bro. I I'm curious about the rest of your year. Like how far do you have your life kind of mapped out? Well, um, I am mapped out. Well, I'm just starting a movie called uh, Christmas Do Over, and, oh, right. um, Your and that's with, yeah. yeah, that's with uh, Rochelle Lefebvre, and um, super excited to get started. It's, it's happening this Sunday, so that's going to be the next three weeks of my life. I've got some renos and uh, around the house, and some Papa things that I'm doing, and a bunch of films in development that I'm producing. So, oh, cool. That's the next the last five years of my life has been for the most part producing. And it's honestly like speaking of work, it's been one of the best decisions I made, you know, it's just like, I'm able to create the content I want to see and actually see that through and be a part of uh, filmmaking at, you know, 360 degrees from financing to, um, you know, to, to casting, to writing, to like all the bits and pieces of it. Wardrobe. And what's that? I said wardrobe. <laughs> Wardrobe, yeah, as well, yeah. <laughs> actually, actually, yeah. Thankfully, thankfully, uh, the the network that I work predominantly with, which is which is Hallmark, they're they're uh, they're so um, you know attuned and, and they they really like having a hand on on things like wardrobe, so I don't have to decide every piece of clothing down to the so to the socks. But right. it's just such a rewarding experience, and you know, I've always found myself to be um, you know more of a more of a crew member than a than a front man, yeah. and. Uh, even though um, I played a front man in in uh, in both in music and in, and in uh in as an actor, but um yeah. you know it's just it's really good just being a part of a team. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure, absolutely. Yeah. And really you, are, are you living here in Vancouver still? Where are you? I am. I'm back. I'm back in Vancouver. Yeah, after several years in Europe, I'm finally. I finally just said, you know, I want to raise my kids here. Yeah, yeah. Don't blame me, man. One of the best cities in the world, right? I I 100 percent agree with you yeah. i think it's one of the best cities in the world and i think all it takes is one sunny spring day to remind you of that and it's coming <laughs> oh it's all coming well let's uh let's grab beers and hit a patio now that you're uh, back in the city yeah i'd love to do that man looking forward to it okay bud well i'll keep in right. touch and uh i'll let you know i'll i'll tag you and stuff when we're chucking this around online you're easy to find of course it's just your name antonio cupo on uh twitter instagram have you got a website you want me to push as well or no i don't really I mean, it's really, just, I, I've been, uh, for as much as I, I, I do anything, it's mainly Instagram that I'm using, but um, I try to let people know what's going on with my life and, uh, you know, working work and, and some, of, some of my personal stuff shows up here and there, which is great. So yeah, follow me on, uh, on Instagram and other, the other platforms. I'm looking forward to, to seeing you in person. Hell yeah, man. Let's do it soon. The Toddcast Podcast on ToddHancock.ca. Talmor is my home. My family have worked the land for generations. 
My gran says the island does not belong to us, but we belong to the island. And we must be ready, for a great evil is coming, and death follows with it. Listen and subscribe to the latest season of Undertow, The Harrowing, a story glass production presented by Realm, available wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, this is Rob Benedict. And I am Richard Spate. We were both on a little show you might know called Supernatural. It had a pretty good run, 15 seasons, 327 episodes. And though we have seen, of course, every episode many times, we figured, hey, now that we're wrapped, let's watch it all again. And we can't do that alone. So we're inviting the cast and crew that made the show along for the ride. We've got writers, producers, composers, directors, and we'll of course have some actors on as well, including some certain guys that played some certain pretty iconic brothers. It was kind of a little bit of a left field choice in the best way possible. The note from Kripke was, he's great, we love him, but we're looking for like a really intelligent Duchovny type. With 15 seasons to explore, it's going to be the road trip of several lifetimes. So please join us and subscribe to Supernatural then and now. I'm Laura Cathcart Robbins, and I'm the host and creator of Only One in the Room podcast. Every week, my co-host Scott Slaughter and I invite you to join us for an hour and lose yourself in someone's incredible Only One story. We talk to the realest of real people, dealing with issues like infertility, addiction, human trafficking, and body shaming. Oh, and we want to be fair, so we talk to some celebrities, too. Oscar winners, New York Times bestselling authors, supermodels, and even the most decorated U.S. Winter Olympian. Everyone is invited to share their only one story with our listeners. This podcast is for anyone who has ever felt alone in a room full of people, which is to say that this podcast is for everyone. Download Only One in the Room wherever you listen to podcasts today.